the next uh, item that I'm going to be covering is slings. So slings of the basic media that we see in the industry, steel wire rope, uh, covering multi-leg slings, uh, hard eye and indeed soft eye, looking at the two variants of textile, both of webbing sling and a round sling, and uh, a little bit of John Wayne chain in there as well. Uh, all slings are classed as what? Thank you, join in, makes my life easier. Uh, accessory, so in accordance with loader inspected, how often? Every six months, by a competent person again. So as that competent person, we decide what tests are necessary. Uh, as with all lifting equipment, the one basic thing we have to do is what? With regards to any form of inspection, what do we have to be able to do? You need to be able to look at it, don't you? Now, can we carry out a thorough examination on the end of the phone? No. What about FaceTime? No. No? Uh, if I've got 20 steel wire rope slings to inspect, 19 are hanging up, showroom condition, absolutely perfect, but the 20th one's missing. If 19 are perfect, surely I can pass the 20th one off. No, so if you can't see it and you can't get your hands onto it, you can't make a judgment. So uh, when we're looking at any form of slings, uh, with regards to sling lengths, or indeed uh, multi-legs, or indeed multiple slings itself, you need to inspect every single sling and every single part of that sling. When we come on to chain a little bit later, do I have to inspect every single link? Yes, if you don't want to inspect every link, go work for McDonald's and kill people that way. Starting with steel wire rope, so who deals with steel wire rope? What do we know? Steel wire rope slings then, with regards to discard criteria, what are we looking at? So we've got broken wires, broken strands. That's proper, like, passing out time, isn't it? That's, that's absolutely <laughs> horrific. But yes, we'll look at uh, uh, broken wires. Kinks. OK, always a favourite. Are we allowed kinks? OK, and where does that degree end or start? <coughs> Is there a set criteria with regards to kinks? Quiet audience. You've not had lunch. I will trip myself up, entertain you. I've got King K and I've got King B. Can you pass King K? Yeah? Would you pass King B? Why? OK, a popular misconception that we, we hear an awful lot, especially delivering the, uh, the courses in certain parts of the world, is um, if the rope is kinked but it pulls straight under load, then it's a pass. Well, you put enough load on any form of sling, that kink will pu uh, pull straight. Uh, a subtle kink here on the left-hand side. Can we pass it? Of course we can. What's the problem with the kinks in uh, position B? What's likely to happen here and here? Can't hear. I really am deaf. Hard to the wire, the core. OK, where? Pops out, doesn't it? Whenever we take steel wire rope, if it's bent around too tight a radius, and it's something you may see when we start looking at hard eyes a little bit later on, when you start bending it really, really tight, what starts to become exposed? The core. Is that a good day or a bad day? Horrific day. So if we look at the kinks, we look at the kinks here. The wires on the outside will be put under tension. The wires on the inside are going to be put under compression. So what you're going to get on the inside is a, a flattening, a cushion of the rope. Good or bad? Horrific. The wires on the outside, because they're in tension, as you start bending steel wire rope, it'll want to start opening up, which then leads the, uh, to the core becoming exposed. Uh, horrific. Also, because you're putting the wires under that tensile loading, this is where you like to see an awful lot of broken wires. So when it comes down to uh, kinks, there is no set hard discard criteria. It's down to your judgment as the competent person. However, look for secondary defects, depending on how aggressive or excessive the kink itself is. Uh, what else are we looking for when it comes to steel wire rope? OK, so corrosion. How much corrosion are we allowed? Is there a set cri uh, criteria? Where can corrosion occur? Inside and outside. So we've got internal and external corrosion. Which one's going to make you more worried than another? Why? 
because it's shown you've got big, massive problems with the, the core, haven't you? Um, the problem when it comes to inspecting steel wire rope is we can't see what? You can't see the internal wires, you can't see the core. Is there a way of doing it? Wire rope, uh, wire rope clamps spit it up against the, the, the layer of the rope, depending on the diameter of the rope, unless you're garth. Um, you've also got to be careful not to nip that or pinch the core when you go to reseat it. Uh, there are other means of inspecting steel wire rope. When it comes to MRT, we're not really looking at doing it for slings, are we? It's, it's not practicable. Long hoist ropes, then, yeah, definitely. Uh, internal corrosion, massive issue. It shows us uh, that we've got a problem with the core. External corrosion, again, in both cases, is down to our discretion. Uh, what other defects do we get with steel wire rope? Feral damage. Okay, feral damage. So again, we can go back to the next cuts, the cracks, gouges. Right, most ferrules are likely to be made from what? Aluminium. Aluminium is a very soft metal. However, performs well under compressive stress. It's quite easy to make uh, swage dies at the back end. Because it's that soft metal, it then becomes prone to gouging, doesn't it? Can that affect the mechanical strength of the termination? Massively. When it comes to the markings on a sling, as with regards to any sling, as we talked about with the first set of uh, modules, all the markings need to be... Clear, legible, present for a lifetime in service. Now, most of the markings, when it comes to slings, will be on some form of suitable tag. Is that acceptable? Of course it is. However, certain industries, certain areas of the world view a tag as a, a potential drops object, so they don't choose to mark it on there. They then start going back to the ferrules. Can we mark the ferrules? Providing we don't do what? Do I want to punch the markings, serial number, working load limits, capacities, range of angles, into the ferrule, so deep, so hard and aggressive, that if I hold out the window, people in Manchester can read it. So, yes, the markings need to be clear, legible, present, marked in the correct place, but not too deep, not too hard, not too uh, aggressive. Uh, other problems with ferrules. Gouging, what about cracking and splitting? How many splits are we allowed in the ferrule? Just a little one. No, because a little sp uh, split, again, acts as that stress riser, uh, quite rapidly then starts opening up under load. What's likely, uh, likely to happen in and around these areas at the top where the wire comes in and forms uh, into the ferrule itself? You can start getting uh, uh, splitting open. This is where you start getting accelerated corrosion. Uh, so it's certain areas. What about this little bad lad here? Okay, everyone happy with what I'm talking about with regards to a live end and a dead end of a rope? Live end goes to the opposite end of the sling down to the lower termination. The dead end, is this part here. Now, is it allowed to stick out the back end? Yes, but there is a recommendation, isn't it? And it depends on how the rope's been cut with regards to heat, no more than one times the diameter, no heat, back down to half times uh, the diameter of the rope. Why is it a maximum? What happens to wire when it's, if it was uh, protruding out? It starts to splay out. Is that a health hazard? Bearing in mind, we, we all like to pick up the steel wire rope by the ferrules, like drinking tea, little pinky gets curled up underneath. Could it also become a snag hazard? So we've got that maximum dead end protrusion. Can it be flush? Yes, incredibly difficult to, uh, to do. Can it be inside? Only with uh, special tapered ferrules, but then the dead end needs to be seated up to where the taper begins. We'll look at those shortly. <coughs> so when we're looking at uh, dead end protrusion, we're not looking at excessive can be flushed, but we don't want it to be inside. Why would it be inside? Could be due, uh, due to poor manufacture. But then you've got to question QC procedures and things like that. What else? So we're back to overloading, we're back to shock loading, aren't we? Is there a way to determine if it's been shock loaded or overloaded? If the dead end's been pulled back in through overload, what's going to happen to this measurement? It's going to increase. What's going to happen to the, the thimble? It's going to become loose. What's likely to happen to the lower terminal fitting with regards to the throat on the hook? Potentially opening up. So we're here to, uh, to, we're here to qualify lifting equipment, are we? We're confirming it's doing what's supposed to, confirming it's not doing what's not to, that it's free from defects, and for the foreseeable future, it's going to be safe to use. But we can also be a little bit like a crime scene investigation, where we put one, two, and three together, Dead ends inside the ferrule. Thimbles become distorted, loose, turned into a, uh, not a heart shape, a teardrop. It's like a drip from your nose. Excuse me. Uh, distortion in either the upper or the lower terminal fitting. So if you put one, two, three together, you've overloaded this, fail. 
What else are we looking for with steel wire rope? Defects wise. So we've got kinks, our discretion, but then we're looking for secondary defects with regard to uh, core, broken wires and the like. Damage, split, cracked ferrules. Markings clear, legible. What have we got at the top? So we've got master links. Whether it's a single master link or a quad link assembly, master link assembly, master link with intermediate links, whatever your flavour of wording is. Um, upper terminal fitting. With regards to master links, shouldn't really have to cover this into too much detail, but there may be people that work overseas. Uh, how many legs are we allowed into a single master link? Two. When we go to three legs, four legs, or indeed five legs, when we're dealing with containers and like, they all go into a into a quad link assembly. That's every region around the world apart from one. America, God bless them. Is there a potential for a load to be uh, lifted quayside, landed onto a vessel in New York? That uh, vessel then sails into Southampton. The sling arrangement stays with the load. It gets lifted off four legs into a single mass link. That then travels up to God's country, Manchester, Old Trafford, probably carrying a trophy. It gets offloaded there and they go, what a lovely sling. I'll keep that for the foreseeable. Is that going to be a problem? So simple things like compatibility, the correct amount of legs into the mass link. The mass link's likely to be made out of steel. So we're looking at the nicks, the cuts, the cracks, the gouges, the stress rises, the chemical damage, heat damage, corrosion. That's damage to the internal structure. It's affecting the manufacturer's heat treatment. Then we're looking at mechanical deformation, bending, twist and deformation, distortion. Likely to be welded. Weld centrally positioned down one of the long edges, so uh, no form of weld defects. Can we NDT it? You're perfectly within your rights if qualified or indeed get an external agency to carry out NDT. We don't go into economics at Lear. Yes, cost of NDT and potential sling assembly, that's down to you to decide. But NDT is an option. We also have a recommendation. Bearing in mind, most things will have a sling tag. We recommend that you put the serial number onto the master link. Why would we do that? Traceability, because if that tag becomes detached and removed, what have you now lost? Full identity, full traceability of that sling. But if you've marked the mass link up with the correct serial number, can you then identify it? Go back to the manufacturer's documentation, re uh, get another tag, remark it accordingly. So when you put the markings, put them up and around here, yeah? That's the easy to find a foot there. Is that acceptable? No, we never mark in a high stress area. That's immediate discard criteria. Markings are up there by the manufacturer all day long. Markings by the end user, so mark it in a suitable low stress area. Uh, so metallic damage throughout, being around a piece of material, how much wear do we allow? 10% for most manufacturers here at Lear, we allow for 8%. The guys that have attended about 15 different courses. Um, okay, steel wire rope. So we've got the kinks discussed. We've got corrosion, internal, external. What else? You mentioned... <laughs> End fittings and terminal fittings. So are we going with hooks? Uh, hooks made from what? Steel. Steel. Nicks, cuts, cracks, gouges, chemical damage, heat damage, corrosion, bending, twist and deformation, distortion. How much wear? 10% in accordance with most manufacturers. In the absence of that, inspect. Use our guidance at Lear, 8%. All hooks must have a safety latch, less the C hooks and obviously the foundry hooks. So the safety latch, does that form part of our inspection? Must be fitted. Functional chest, reasonable spring tension, or indeed if it's a self-locking hook, that the locking assembly, uh, assembly is still capable of closing the throat off on the hook. You get a, a brand new self-locking hook, works like a charm. After it's done one, probably two lift, you start to get free play into the jaw mechanism. Can you still pass it if it's still closing the throat of the hook off? Of course you can, because it's still doing the job. Is the safety latch ever low bearing? No, so we want it to be there, present, compatible to the hook. No signs of throat opening, closing up through misuse. Um, and that if it is a spring-loaded safety latch, that there's still reasonable spring tension. Uh, we've talked about the ferrules. Critical. What about the thimbles? What's the purpose of a thimble? So it's to protect the eye, isn't it? Stop direct cuts, wear and abrasion. Also helps the eye keep its shape in a loaded condition. Also helps uh, the load to be shared across the whole of the eye. Any time there's a permanent metallic fitting, they must be fitted with, so a master link assembly, lower link, uh, lower uh, terminal fitting such as a hook, must be into a hard eye or into a thimble die. Is that thimble low bearing? No, the load passes through it, but it's not low bearing. But does it need to be seated correctly? Does it need to be compatible to the rope? Why? One, it could fall out. 
But if it's too small, the rope will always want to force, uh, force itself in, which can lead to crushing of the rope. If it's too large, then it doesn't start supporting the rope in the first place. Captive locked off, secure. Shouldn't be able to start wiggling it around, turning it around and around and around, going, oh, look, at this one comes out and put it back in. Again, that's either through poor manufacture or indeed um, misuse from the end user. So thimbles throughout, whether it's single leg, multiple leg. The steel wire rope, uh, discard criteria. You mentioned broken or fractured strands. OK, that's a proper sick in the mouth job. How many fractured strands are we allowed? Do we know how a steel wire rope is made? What's the smallest part of a steel wire rope? What's the smallest part of a steel wire rope? It's individual wires, isn't it? Individual, individual wires wrapped up around a centre wire forms up a strand. Strands wrapped up around a core forms up the, the rope. I'll ask you again, how many fractured strands are we allowed? There you go. Everyone play that game? None, absolutely none. What about wires then? Are we allowed broken wires? Does anyone know how many we're allowed? Six to ten? Strands, oh, let's see. <laughs> we're back to the sick in the mouth job. Um, you're not too far wrong with the six, though. You ever heard of the fa phrase, no more broken wires than six and six diameters, 14 and 30, no more than three adjacent? You have now. Do you, do you actually understand it? Understanding what steel wire rope, what, what causes broken wires? Sharp edges? Misuse, corrosion, impact. So there's always usually a root cause, isn't there? So broken wires tend to sort of like, it's like London buses, they, they come in packs. Nothing for ages and then, oh my God, uh, sickness. So that your discard criteria, which you could actually apply either manufacturer's information or indeed there is a European standard out there. So BSEN 13414 part two, Annex A, section 3.2-5, something along those lines. Say it's no more than six and six diameters. No more than 14 and 30 diameters. No more than three adjacent. What it means, there's my steel wire rope. If you squint, you'll get the idea. What's that gonna be? Pick a diameter of wire rope. Keep it friendly. I love friendly, 10. <laughs> the little black dots are broken wires. So 10 millimeter, di uh, 10, uh, millimeter uh, diameter rope. When we measure wire rope, where do we measure it? Always across the peaks, yeah? So it's opposing strands, never meant, uh, measure across the valleys because you're going to fail it uh, due to the wear criteria. So we inspect our steel wire rope. Do we have to inspect every single leg? Do we have to inspect every single part of every leg? Ex you, you have to. You can't make a, 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 a judgment without inspecting the whole lot. Broken wires usually occur for a reason. So we're inspecting our steel wire rope and lo and behold, we find some broken wires. Put a mark on your sling. The first criteria is no more than six in six diameters. So I take the diameter of the rope, which is, times it by, which is, and I measure up the rope, 60 mil. I then count the amount of broken wires in there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hands up for pass. Bit of a clue here. <laughs> OK, um, the 6 and 6, uh, the 14 and 30 is, is maximum. So you can fail brand new equipment, providing you've got a reason to, uh, uh, an, an acceptable judgment to go back um, and qualify that, that statement. 6 and 6 is within its criteria. Would you be wanting to give that sling six months? Why? It's one, it's right on the limit, but if we're getting broken wires, does that make that steel wire rope stronger or weaker? Weaker. How much weaker has it got by? Are you expecting to see more accelerated broken wires? So nothing, nothing, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So we're not putting it under a written scheme. At the bottom of that report of thorough examination, it says latest date by which the next examination must be carried out. You don't have to give it uh, six months. Could I give it a week? 
You could do. What's, what's that now start doing? Is that facilitating the end user? You're right, right on the discard criteria. I can, I can only give it a week. So he's allowed to use it for a week, for example, but that also gives him a week to do what? Get a replacement. So instead of coming in there with the sort of tie kickers going fail, 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 why? Because it's a naughty word. We, we can start qualifying. We're getting him on side, aren't we? He's never happy. So six and six would be a pass. The other criteria then is 14 and 30. So I take my dime out of the rope with being 10 mil, times it by 30, which gives us... Glad your maths is good. And I measure along there. We already know we've got six there. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Pass or fail? Fail. So just because it's passed the six and six, it's now failed on the no more than 14 and 30, yeah? This is just showing you the application of it. I've said where you found the first broken wire, go for the six and six diameters, 14 and 30. But that six and six uh, diameter is very, very flexible. So if I take this and get rid of it, pass or fail? What if I move my six, uh, six diameters a little bit along the rope to perhaps that portion there? Not to scale. And recount and I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, hello. Seven. So it doesn't have to start at that very first broken wire. You can slide it along where you've got local concentrated uh, wires. The three adjacent then. This is three broken wires in one strand in one position of the rope. This is likely through some form of impact damage where something damage, I hate that word, impact defect, it is damage, isn't it? Where something struck it. So the six and six is across all of the strands in that particular six diameters or uh, uh, 30 diameters. The three adjacent is localized broken wires in one strand in one position of the rope. So as we know, steel wire rope, part of the preform in the closing operation, it be part of that corkscrew effect. If I come up here with one single strand and I've got two broken wires, pass. That strand then comes back underneath the rope and appears under, over here. I've got another two broken wires, pass, because they're not localized. But if I've got four broken wires here in one strand, then it's a fail. It's not going for the six and the six diameters, it's the four closely linked in that one particular area. What's going to happen to steel wire rope after it's been in service for a long period of time? It's going to wear. How much wear are we allowed, does anyone know? That is 10%, and that is back to the standard. So this six and six, 14 and 33 adjacent 10% loss of diameter due to wear, you can actually quote a European standard with regards to this. So it's not my, my judgment as Dave, Ricardo, Phil. It's, well, I'm writing it off in accordance with the standard. It just backs you up. Um, what else can happen to steel wire rope? If I said sunken strand, what would, what, what would that be me trying to steer you towards? Damage defect core, especially when you start looking at the fibre cores. That core is massively important, isn't it? If that core perishes, it creates a gap. And then it's like a game of hungry hippos. One of the strands is then fighting to get on the inside, you then get a sunken strand. What about core protrusion sticking out? What about bird caging? What causes bird caging? Shock loading, bird caging, two trains driving together and they explode and they get pushed up. Uh, so yeah, uh, cause for rejection. Um, lovely, moving on then, chain. Who inspects chain? What we're looking for? Ooh. Damage, there we go, finished, happy? Textile slings, what are we inspecting for? Happy? As your certificate, have a great weekend, been a lovely audience, see you in the bar. Right, fire it to me then, chain, made out of. Throughout the whole le uh, length of the sling assembly, being made from steel, this applies to the mass link, the couplers, the hooks, the chain itself. We're back to that, nicks, cuts, cracks, gouges, stress rises. Chemical damage, heat damage, direct, indirect. Corrosion, your discretion as a competent person. Mechanical deformation, bending, twisting, deformation, distortion, none. How much wear in a mass link? It's, it's the same generics throughout, isn't it? Most manufacturers allow for 10%, and that's who we always inspect to. Always go to the manufacturer's information. In the absence of that, you can go to the standard. In the absence of that, go with what we say at Lear, and that is 8%. 
So if you've got the manufacturer's info, go to the 10%. If you haven't, then use our recommendation, which is 8%. Would you inspect this master link using the same criteria that we'd use on the, the, uh, the steel wire rope one? Would we apply the same criteria with regards to the lower terminal fitting? And that it must have, and it must be able to function, whether it's self-locking uh, self or indeed spring-loaded. Reasonable spring tension, no signs of throat opening. Compatible. How does this attach to this? So you've got a clevis pin with a retaining pin. Does that clevis pin need to be manufacturer's approved parts? Why? Because it's carrying the load, isn't it? It's a load bearing part. Does that retaining pin need to be there? We've lost it. Whack a nail in. Nail does a job, doesn't it? Or a screw. Is that acceptable? No, so it's manufacturer's approved parts, uh, captively locked off throughout. With regards to this thing being mechanically assembled, at the top we've got a connector. When we look at thorough examination, it's confirming it's doing what's supposed to, confirming it's not doing what it's not supposed to. What is that supposed to do? It allows the chain to be connected to the master link, but what does it do? Works like a knuckle. So do we want that to be free moving, not seized? What would cause it to seize? Is it always overloading? It could be corrosion. So which one is it? You don't know. So in the interest, remove it from, uh, from service, pending further investigation, probably easier and a hell of a lot safer just to replace the parts. Again, with this particular sling, with it being the clevis pin connectors and indeed the mechanical joining devices at the top, can we change them out? If we are going to change them out, as I, I say to most classes I teach, eBay, Amazon, get a right good deal, Woolworths, or do we go to parts I, as identified on the manufacturer's certificate? Why? Because it's low bearing. If you start changing parts out, what could we, what could we be invalidating? The DOCs and the like. Put it in simply terms, we have a lottery winner and he's taken everyone for lunch afterwards. He's, he drives a Ferrari. Would you change the brakes out for Fiat Punto? No. You, but, the, but there we go. Cost is always an element, isn't it? But then you go to hit the brakes and guess what? You don't stop. They then investigate it. They bring Ferrari in because your family's suing them into the ground. And they go, that's not my brakes. What are Ferrari you doing? Walking away. That's the same with lifting equipment. So don't start putting illegal substitutes in there unless you've got manufacturer's approval uh, with regards to other compatible components. Uh, the uh, mechanical joining device, free moving, not stiff, not slack in operation, correctly seated, correctly fitted, male to female, female to male. Is it possible to go female to female and male to male? Yeah, yeah. But then you've got to wonder, haven't you? However, the common sense doesn't list, exist in a, a legal argument. It's, it, this is where we have things like this um, CPD workshop. Uh, rounded piece of material, how much wear are we looking at? Two? You said 10%, didn't you? Two percent? Two percent on a coupler? Mm. Most manufacturers, again, it's back to the 10%. In the uh, absence of that manufacturer's uh, information, go with what we say at Lear, it's back to the 8%. So deformation, deformation. So you're allowing 2% bending, twisting. So you're allowing something to be shock loaded, deformed, and distort, and you're going to say it's safe. If it's deformed by 2%, pass or fail. When it comes to deformation, stretch, how much? None, because what's the root cause? And what's it done? It's weakened it. We're then looking at the chain itself. With regards to this chain then, with any form of sling, do we need to make sure the markings are clear, legible, present? Do we need to make sure that the markings on the chain are clear, legible, present? With regards to the grade mark? When we looked at the machine chain, fine tolerance chain is graded using letters. Sling chain is numbers, which the European standards will be either a four or an eight. Briefly covering it, because I don't want to get into trouble with the boss. Is grade 10 out there? Is grade 12 out there? Covered under European standards? 818 only covers grade 4 and grade 8 at present, but is it acceptable? Of course it is, because it meets all the legal requirements, the essential health and safety requirements of the directive. Uh, okay, where on the chain? How much loss of diameter? 8% loss of diameter. How much elongation due to interlink where? 5%. I'm not gambling anymore. <laughs> Please don't gamble. Uh, little Dave's down the bottom. Go and see him on a power course. 
The 2% applies to uh, high-speed hoists. 3%, as we talked about earlier, for the machines, because it's engaging with the pocketed wheel. With regards to this, the elongation due to interlinked wear increases to 5%, because what doesn't this engage with? It's not uh, mating with any form of moving parts. So it's 5%. How much elongation due to stretch? Just a little bit. None. How many knots are we allowed to tie in it? You've, oh, someone, someone, see, someone's entertained. Seen it? No, no. If there's a shortening clutch fitted, do we inspect the shortening clutch? Free from sharp edges and the like, caps will be locked off, manufacturer's approved parts. What about a homemade shortening, uh, shortening clutch? Not in a bolt. Everyone's giggling there. I don't want to know what you guys are doing. Yeah, so no form of illegal modifications. When we come to the legs, how many legs have we got here? If this came into service as a two-legged thing and you see that one leg, pass or fail? Why? It's been altered. You've changed the configuration. You've changed... Has it been re-rated? If this came into service as a one-legger and he... Could be careful. Found his long-lost brother last night and is now two legs on it. Pass or fail? Again, it's a, it's a legal modification. You're starting to invalidate all the, uh, the documentation um, behind it. Can I change the parts out, upper and lower terminal fittings? Yeah, yeah using manufacturer certified parts. Having replaced them, do I need to heat treat them? Do I need to proof load test? Do I need to do any form of load test? All I do is a visual inspection to make sure it's been seated and it's been uh, uh, fitted correctly. Necessary documentation, report of thorough examination, making a note of the, the defects and back into service, yeah? Everything already arrives in a treaty condition. Wrapping it up with webbing slings, round slings. What we're looking for, inspection wise. Where's a good place to start with absolutely everything? So the markings. Clear legible present for lifetimes in service. Securely attached. What if this is about to hang off? It's being ripped. Can we take all the markings and just start scribing it onto the side of the sling? No, dear God, no. Defects then, inspection criteria. Cuts, how many cuts are we allowed? None. So we're talking cuts across the face, longitudinal, or indeed edge cuts. Absolutely zero, because again, you're back to the stress risers. What else? How many burns are we allowed? None. Stitching, how many broken stitches are we allowed? None. How much chemical attack are we allowed? None. Okay, so we're saying no cuts, edge, longitudinal, no missing markings. No burns, no chemical attack. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, no form of chemical attack. Yep, alkali acid. Bearing in mind, polyester slings like a bit of acid. Murder, death, kill when it comes to uh, alkalis. Big problem with that is, is multi-leg slings. Because when you look at the master link, the quad link assembly, that's alloy steel, hates acid, gets on all right-ish with alkali. When you look at the sling, loves a bit of acid, doesn't like the alkali. So this is compatibility. Information between you, step the muscling down to the, the grade four and the like. Uh, so no cuts. What about knots? No knots? It's basically nothing, isn't it? It's, we're not expecting showroom condition, and that's with all lifting equipment. It's going to get beaten up. But go to and limited on it. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, no cuts, no cuts, no uh, burns. Uh, what about chafing? Chafing, where it's being used in choke hitch or it's being constantly reeved around the load, where you get a lifting up of the fibres. Allowed? You have to allow some. But if it's become excessive and it's starting to affect the mechanical strength, then it's a fail. What about a glazing? A surface shine on a, a textile sling. What causes it? Friction. Friction. Again, we're back to uh, rigging arrangements, aren't we? Your discretion. When you look at uh, any form of textile sling, very, very soft, very, very pliable. If you've got that constant friction, it starts to take on that glazed appearance, it starts to stiffen up, you lose the, uh, the flexibility again, uh, discard criteria. Pardon me, wrapping it up then with round slings. What's the inspection criteria? There you go. Subtle difference is, is this is a bit like steel wire rope. What can't we see? The core. The core. So when it comes to examination, Lola still places the duty on us to decide what, if any, tests are necessary. Visual, would I want to do some form of uh, functional, manual, or a tactile inspection? Because what carries the load? Where's the core? 
on the inside. So what can't you see? So again, start at the, uh, the tag label. This is sort of fast forward. Touchy feely, feeling for foreign objects, contaminants. Get back to the label and do what? Flip it over and then do uh, and repeat it. What does that ensure? That I do a thorough examination. That's kind of why Lola uses that word, thorough examination, does exactly what it says on the tin. You're inspecting the sling and there's a little bit of black engineer, not engineer's tape, electrical tape on it. Makes your life even easier. It's just telling you what they've already done. Take it off, you see a little small hole. Pass or fail. But the cover's not load bearing. It has to withstand two times the working load limit, but... But if there's a hole, what's caused it and what's on the inside? Could a little stone get in there? A little stone's not a problem, it's only a little one. You handle these, baggy. When they're under load, they lay flat. If you've got a little soap, that little sod's law sits underneath, you put this to some form of reeving, moving, what's, what's that stone gonna do? It's gonna cut it and shred it to pieces. Uh, with regards to both sets of textile sling, just to wrap it up, soiling. Soiling is what? Dirt contamination. Where do you stand on soiling then? Yes or no? It, it's, it's back down to your discretion. You've got to expect textile slings to get dirty. Engineer finishes using it. Again, he's not cradling it. It's, I'll clean the shop floor while I'm going. If it's become heavily soiled, contaminated, can we clean it? Bit of fairy liquid? Warm, clean water. Do I want to start using some form of uh, cleaning agent? Why? Because most form of cleaning agent soaps sit on the pH scale alkaline. Most of our textile slings are polyester. What doesn't polyester like? There it goes. It's clean and it smells like summer meadow, but you've just killed it. What about solar degradation, UV damage? What's the first indication with all textile slings? You start getting a uh, loss of colour, it starts to bleach. Advanced solar degradation is a breaking down of the fibres. Treat it like your skin. If you're peeling, your skin's damaged. If that's flaking away, then again, that's excessive sun damage. Pull it, remove it from service. Uh, am I okay jet washing my slings? No, because then you're forcing all the, the dirt, the grime uh, uh, in through the sling. Thanks for your time and attention. Uh, hopefully of some benefit. Again, I'll be kicking around as with the rest of the training team. So if any problems, questions, then please feel free.